Okay, let's go ahead and get started. This is Bonnie McFarland. I'd like to welcome you to our last scheduled uh, state and federal meeting for this for this school year. But then who knows, things keep changing. So we may end up being in touch with you sooner than we think. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the only one who's a little disoriented. We're supposed to be doing LCAPs and, and doing CONAPs right now. And we're not doing any of that, but a lot of other different things. So we'll be talking about all those things today. Uh, our team is with you. Uh, Adrian Balcazar, Evan Bartelheim, Amy Tomamatsu, Rachel Garcia, Hello. and Jimmy and uh, we'll be, and uh, you'll be hearing from all of them today. And again, there's the link for the handouts and the recording of the presentation. So all of that will be posted for you uh, on our website. So let's take a look at today's agenda. And we're gonna start with just a, an update on federal funding and then a brief update uh, regarding the consolidated application submission. Also, we want to do uh, talk about federal program monitoring, what that's going to look like coming for moving forward. We have some updated, very updated information on CARES funding and the various uh, funding sources coming from the federal government for, for, uh, for LEAs. And then next we have some updates on the LCAP federal addendum, some uh, new information on Williams and some upcoming deadlines. We also hope to end the meeting a little bit early today because we know some of you are interested in participating in CDE's Tuesday at 2 webinar on school-wide programs and the information is here. So we want to give you a few minutes to breathe and relax before the 2 o'clock uh, CDE meeting. So we're going to try and move through fairly quickly, um, but touch on everything that we have on the agenda. So if you have questions, next slide, uh, please, as usual, type them in the chat box and we're going to send out back to you as usual. We'll be sending you um, a Q&A in response to all your questions. So we appreciate those coming in. They help us um, kind of know what some of the issues are out there and some of those we end up having to research them to get you a clear and correct answer. If you don't receive them via email, they are always posted also on our website, so you can always access them there. So let's get started and take a look at federal funding. <clears throat> I just wanted to get, do a brief update on federal funding because I know a lot of you are trying to plan for the coming year. We hope to have some estimates for you fairly soon but we wanna give you some cautions uh, if, regarding those estimates. And we also wanna give you some suggestions and guidance for how you can start estimating for the coming year for your federal programs. So let's take a look first <clears throat> at just the different types of federal funds. And this year it's gotten a little bit more complicated because we have some new federal funding coming. And I think there's been some confusion about what those funds are. The first group are your ongoing formula grant funds. And all of those, with the exception of Title uh, One Part C migrant funds, all the rest are included in the consolidated application. So those are ongoing funding sources that have been around for a long time that you're used to getting annually. And those have not changed essentially. And you will apply for all of those through the Con app. Some other funds that you have, and we just listed a couple here, but there are other ongoing discretionary federal grant funds. So some of you have districts, um, uh, schools that are in comprehensive support and improvement, and those schools get some additional funds through the school improvement grant. These are grants that go to the state. They actually are discretionary, but in California, they pretty much go out to all agency with the, uh, with, that are eligible with a fairly simple allocation process. But those are ongoing funds as our Title IV Part B, which is another one you might be familiar with. That's the 21st Century Community Learning Centers. Again, that's a competitive grant that um, is applied for through the department, but it is an ongoing ESSA program. So all the programs in the top two groups are element, um, the um, ESSA programs under the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. The next list, though, are one-time COVID relief funds. And those, we'll be talking about them more in depth a little bit later, but they are separate, they don't fall under ESEA, and they are not subject to those rules or requirements. They come through the CARES Act, which is a separate bill. 
and most of those come through state, sa state stabilization funds. However, there are some other funding sources that uh, Amy and Evan will be talking about later. That's just kind of an overview of the chunks of federal money that you're receiving. So next slide, <clears throat> we just wanted to review again, you are aware of this, but just gets a little confusing here, the impact of the waivers on federal formula grants. The impact is primarily fiscal on the, uh, for the waivers that came through through the federal government due to COVID. The first is the extension of the period of availability. That applies to 2018-19 funds. So those are older funds. Many of you have spent all those funds, but if you have any funds remaining, sometimes the end of the period of availability, it would have been September 30th of this year. It's been extended for one additional year. So sometimes that uh, at the end of that period, people start looking uh, desperately at how to spend those funds. You don't have to do that now. You have another year if you have any unspent 2018-19 funds. If you're not sure, you can check on that through the CDE website, go to Finance and Grants, click on Categorical Programs, click then on the program you're interested in, and they'll have the funding amounts. It'll show how much you um, were eligible for, how much has already been allocated, and how much is left. You can do that for any year. The second a waiver applied to carryover of 2019-20 Title I funds. So typically the state may only approve a waiver for carryover more than 15% once every three years. This waiver allows them to waive that carryover for 1920. So again, if you were unable to spend, and the reason for this is possibly with school closures, maybe some of those funds weren't spent. This will not be a problem this year. You'll have one additional year to spend those funds, and you'll report that in the winter CONAP submission next February. As you recall, there's a carryover page, and that's where you report how much carryover you have. There's a request for a waiver, and that will be automatically granted. The next was <clears throat> uh, impact of the waivers was primarily on Title IV Part A, and Title IV, uh, the changes were in the past, there were percentage amounts for the three areas of uh, in, included in Title IV, and you had to spend a certain amount in each of those areas. There were also some restrictions on the percentage allowed for use of technology. Those restrictions have been lifted for Title IV, allowing districts to move those funds around, and in many cases, that supported districts in purchasing additional technology resources. Bottom line, all other program requirements remain in place for all federal formula grants. These are the only things that were impacted by the waiver. Okay, next slide. So when you're trying to estimate how much money you're gonna get, we thought it might be helpful just to have a little reminder of where those, um, how those funds are allocated and what's used as to determine the funding. First of all, Title I Part A uh, is based on federal census data. It includes five through 17 year olds who are, uh, who are census, identified as census poor and that data is updated annually. This actually should have an asterisk there because for, for um, charter schools and county offices of education, federal census data cannot be used because census data is based on a geographic location. In other words, as a district, you have a geographic location you serve. But for a charter school or a county office, that doesn't exist. As a result, in determining allocations for charter schools and county offices, CDE has to use free and reduced price meal uh, numbers. But that's only for charters and for, uh, for county offices. Title II Part A has shifted under ESSA and they moved eventually, they gradually moved the, uh, the percentages uh, for the basis of, of determining funding and put a greater emphasis on poverty numbers. So you'll notice Title II Part A is now based 80% on poverty and 20% on enrollment. So as you're considering what Title II might look like moving forward, you really your poverty numbers are gonna drive that uh, funding amount more than your enrollment. Title III English Learner Programs 
is based on your English learner count in CalPADS multiplied by a per pupil amount, which you received recently in a letter from CDE. So you can get a pretty good idea of, of what those funds look like. Title III Part A immigrant funds. Keep in mind, you have to have a minimum of 21 immigrant students and in the past, it was an increase of 2% over the prior two years. This has been changed for 2020-21 moving forward. Now it will only require a 1% um, growth in your immigrant population. So I know some districts were just very much on the cusp of getting that funding. So you might check your numbers and see if you might now be eligible. Title IV is based on the same proportion as your prior year's Title I funding amount. And keep in mind, there is a minimum of $10,000 grant amount. So if you get a small amount, you know you'll at least get that $10,000 amount if you're eligible. So let's take a look a little more closely at some of the programs. <clears throat> Title I final grant amounts are gonna be posted either in July or at, at latest in August. In the meantime, you can do some estimating for 2021, taking into consideration the following. First of all, what was your 1920 final allocation? Those numbers were just updated and you can find them in a couple places. The CDE website under finance and grants, uh, look under uh, categorical programs, Title I. And if you look at your 1920 amount, you might see that has changed a bit from what you initially got. So what's the final amount? The other place you'll find it is on the spreadsheet with the ESSER funding. When you look up what your ESSER Federal CARES Act funding is, uh, it's based on your Title I um, entitlement. And so um, that amount is also posted there. So if you're not sure what your final entitlement was, you can look there. Things to consider, changes in district enrollment. If you've had a huge shift in numbers of students that are enrolled in your district, that could impact your, uh, your funding. And also changes in your poverty counts. If you're seeing a significant increase or decrease in your number of low-income students, that could also make a difference. And also keep in mind, Title I has a hold harmless amount. That's at the minimum 85%. If you're a higher poverty district, could be 90%, and the highest poverty districts have a 95% hold harmless. The thing to consider, these hold harmless amounts can impact other districts. So if you thought you were getting an increase and the district next door to you falls below that 85, uh, 90 or 95%, those funds may move over there to, to uh, support that district. So it can work for you, but statewide, sometimes it even things out. We're hoping to get some initial estimates for you for Title I very soon, uh, but we want to give you a couple cautions regarding those estimates, and we'll tell you that when we get them, but just want to say it again. At this time, or last we heard, things changed today, but at last we heard the Budget Act, as it's currently uh, written, reflects a lower amount than what is actually in the federal award. So generally, um, the Budget Act has to include all federal funds to allow the state to allocate those funds. Currently, um, for some reason, that Budget Act does not reflect the accurately what's in the federal award. CDE is required to use either the lesser of what's in the Budget Act or what's in the federal allocation from the U.S. Department. So those alloc initial allocations might look a little lower than they might be in the end. So just a little caution there, okay? So let's take a look at Title II. Title II, um, again, start with, your, um, start with your 1920 funding amount. How much did you get last year? And again, the two things to look at, your poverty count, primarily, since it's 80% poverty, and your enrollment. Any changes could impact your funding for Title II going forward. Title III. Okay, Title III, you received a per pupil, a preliminary per pupil amount from CDE for English learner programs, that's $114.40 for immigrant programs, $104.70. So to estimate your Title III EL program, you'll multiply your EL count as reported in CalPLADS by the per pupil uh, rate. And that should give you a good estimate of what your Title III funding will look like for 2021. 
to estimate your immigrant funding for 2021, you multiply your immigrant count of students by that per pupil rate. But remember, it requires a minimum of 21 immigrant students and new this year, only a 1% increase. So again, take a look at that. If you weren't previously eligible, you might be eligible now for Title III immigrant funds. If you receive under $10,000, LEAs are required to join a consortia. If you receive $10,000 or more, that's not required. I, there have been two letters that have gone out recently from the Title III office that have caused confusion on that because the letters that discuss the consortia requirement were sent to all districts. If you anticipate receiving over $10,000 or more, then you are not required to join a consortia. So just don't be confused by those letters. They sent them to everybody, but they only apply to those that receive um, under $10,000. Title IV, <clears throat> few things to consider. First of all, if your LEA didn't apply for or was not eligible for Title I funds in the 1920 school year, then it's not eligible for Title IV funds in 2021 because Title IV is based on the prior year's Title I funding. So keep that in mind. If you chose not to um, uh, participate in Title I last year, it does keep you from being eligible for Title IV, or if you just aren't eligible for Title I because of your poverty level, then it also would impact your Title IV funding. So just something to keep in mind there. But generally what we see is pretty much the funding is flat for most of the programs this year. So we don't, we're not hearing of any significant uh, increase or decrease other than what might be impacted by your district conditions or the state's requirement to, um, to uh, meet those hold harmless uh, amounts. Okay, so next let's take a look at the consolidated application, which is certainly linked to funding. Uh, so first of all, the reopening of the winter uh, data collections. So uh, the winter data collections were open recently and they are gonna be open through June 30th. That was for last year's Con App. 2019-20. This only applies to LEAs that transferred funds out of Title II or Title IV and wish to make some changes in that. Okay, And why would you do that? Well, LEAs that transferred Title IV funds particularly may wish to make changes to take advantage of the Title IV flexibilities that we mentioned just a little while ago. So that would be the primary reason why they opened it up to allow LEAs that transferred funds out of Title IV to then move those funds back into Title IV for 1920 so they could take advantage of flexibilities to meet their technology needs during the COVID crisis. However, there are some things to consider. Next slide, please. If you're thinking of making changes to your transferability uh, from the winter consolidated application for last year, first of all, think about which programs were the funds transferred to? Where did that money go? Is the first question. Did you move it into Title I, Title II? Where did those funds, how did you make those transfers? And then the next question is, what expenditures have already been made with the funds that were transferred into the receiving program? So if you move funds from Title IV into Title III, were those funds expended? And then the next question is, are there adequate funds in the other program to cover the cost? In other words, do you still have Title III funds you could use to cover the cost that initially you used Title IV to pay for? If not, is the LEA prepared to cover the cost with general funds? So because you're going to have expenditures and you're going to have to do some budget transfers. So is that, do you want to do that? Can you do that? Uh, some things to think about. Secondly, uh, thirdly, I guess here, if the funds were transferred into Title I, the question would be, were they included in school allocations? So if you included them in school allocations, what actions are going to be needed to ensure that your winter CONAP school allocation page matches uh, your actual entitlement? So, uh, I'm sorry, matches your school plans. So school plan revision, school site council approval, and again, back to have those funds already been spent and what 
funds are going to be are going to be um, and you have to do budget transfers how are you going to cover the cost from school level expenditures and is your school site council going to be willing to change the um, school plan to make those changes so that's some things to think about if you're thinking about changing transfer um, changing your decisions on transferability so now let's look at next year's CONAF, which is coming soon. The 2021 consolidated application is scheduled to open July 6th, and the submission date is um, August 17th. Okay, you will need board approval prior to submission. However, we've had this question come up: whether well, how am I going to get to the board? In previous years, CDE has allowed LEAs to submit their CONAP, and in that member, it was June 30th. In the past, you had to submit it. You could submit it by June 30th, and they would allow you to have a board approval date through August 31st. You could still submit, have your application go in, and postpone your board approval, but only through August 31st. There's no indication of any change in that, either eliminating that or extending that. Um, the, the indication we're getting is that they plan to keep that August 31st date. Uh, we have not heard about them extending it. So our sense is that you would probably have through August 31st to get board approval on that. If you don't have board approval by their deadline, whether that's a submission date or August 31st, then you can't submit the application until the board approval date. So say it was, you didn't go to the board until September, then you would not be able to submit your uh, CONAP on August 17th. You'd have to wait until September. And the problem with that is that could delay funding because then it probably would not get to the state board in time to be approved and your, they would not start, the money's still there, sort of in the bank for you, but they wouldn't be able to start the allocation process. So your allocations would be delayed. Okay. All right, and any uh, next slide? Okay, other things on the CONAP. Make sure you're signed up for the CDE listserv. You should have received an email this week with um, a list of all the data collections that are gonna be included and the changes that are going to be inclu included. Um, there were fewer changes than we anticipated, actually. We thought there'd be quite a few with the new, um, with the waivers. However, most of the changes were in, part, in Title I Part D and that's delinquent programs and most districts don't uh, take those funds. And um, there is a new Title IV expenditure report. We've not had to report on Title IV expenditures before. So that's going to be included and hasn't been before. The other thing, and we had a, sort of a heads up on this a while ago, and that is that um, the nonprofit private school participation pages have been eliminated. The reason for that is CDE found they were getting a lot of of requests uh, from LEAs, well, from school districts, because this doesn't apply to charters. They were getting a lot of requests in the winter for, for uh, to have to reopen that those pages because the numbers changed. You had private schools and suddenly they chose not to participate or they closed. And so you had to go into a lot of times, districts were having to change those participation numbers. So they've moving that to the winter submission. So that eliminated about three pages there. We will be offering a CONAP workshop on July 16th and the information is gonna be mailed out very soon and we'll also post it. So we will have that available for you. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to Adrian, who's going to talk about FPM. Hi, everyone. Um, wow, I can't even believe the school year is over. So, um, well, FPM, FPM is still happening. There are a few um, FPMs being you know, finished up this uh, month and moving forward. Uh, we, you know, CDE says FPM, as, as well as we all know, FPM is an important necessary function of, of state government. So this will carry on for next year. And so for the upcoming FPMs for 2021 reviews, the districts and the charter schools that have been selected for the 2021 FPM reviews have been notified. They were notified last week um, when the date of the review is going to take place, which programs and which sites were selected for the review. And so uh, some changes are due to the pandemic, CDE has grouped the FBM reviews into two waves. 
So for the on-site reviews scheduled for September to January 2021, all of these reviews will be conducted remotely. And then in November, CDE is going to assess where our state is in terms of the pandemic. And it is at this time that CDE will decide on the format of the reviews that are scheduled for February to June of 2021. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. We all will. And then also just remember that these will, um, they'll remain, uh, you know, conducted remotely uh, with the understanding moving forward that if indeed conditions change uh, in 2021, that the CDE has the right to change the remote process to in-person format for those that are scheduled for February 2021 to June 2021. Moving forward with the trainings, um, originally we had some scheduled for um, virtually, but throughout the year. And so now they've uh, kind of fine tuned it. So all FPM trainings for the 2021 year will be conducted remotely, virtually. And so if you have a scheduled FPM for the month of September 2020 to um, January 2021, your training uh, will definitely take place on July 29th through the 31st. And then if you have one scheduled for February 2021 to June 2021, you, there is another training that will be scheduled December 9th through the 11th of 2020. There was a question to um, ask of CDE. If indeed a district that is scheduled for the FPMs in 2021, would they be able to have access to both training dates? And the answer was yes, because it is being done virtually, so it doesn't impact in terms of, uh, you know, a logistics of, of finding, you know, a physical space for people. So again, uh, look forward to that information and go ahead for those districts being reviewed to sign up for that. There will be critical information in terms of how to deal with a remote FPM and any changes that are coming forward. So with the um, changes would be the program instruments. And so most instruments will be posted at the end of this month and the balance of the instruments will be posted in July. Um, just so you know that the content has already been completed and approved. They're just doing some final edits on the instruments and once they are finalized, they will be posted to the website. So at that point, we'll let you know so that everyone can pull these instruments and start looking, uh, moving forward, what changes in your processes and protocols are going to need to be collected um, as, your, as evidence moving forward. And also to just know that the, uh, there is a new instrument coming out. It's called the disaster instrument. And so we'll be giving you more information as that comes out too as well. And so now, We'll move forward with the CARES Act, and Amy will be giving you information about this. Thank you, Adrian. For our CARES update today, we're going to provide a summary of what we know, and also share some uh, share what it is that we still don't quite know everything about, and things that are still yet to be announced. So we're going to start with the next slide, which shows us a summary table. And this, this table summarizes some of the key features of coronavirus-related funding streams. Um, in the first three blue columns, we have the ESSER, GEAR, and CRF. And those are all federal relief funds, which are part of the Federal CARES Act. In the far right column, the SB117, uh, or the COVID-19 LEA Response Fund, as, as it has also been called, um, was the first coronavirus related fund that was apportioned to districts and that one is a state level fund. So as a point of clarification, that SB 117 is not part of the CARES Act. So what is it that we know? We know the most about the SB 117 and the ESSER funds. SB 117 has already been apportioned to districts based on ADA and this funding has probably been in the works since early April in your districts. The ESSER fund uh, will be released after July 1st, and that makes it a fiscal year 2020-21 fund. And those preliminary allocations to districts have been posted to CD's website, 
So you have those figures as well. The application for these ESSER funds was just released this past Friday. And we'll take a look at that application um, screenshot on the next slide. If we could switch that. So your superintendents likely received an email. Um, we also heard that some uh, CBOs may have received the email. And I know CD said that some emails have bounced back and they're trying to make phone calls to districts to notify you so everybody is aware um, that the ESSER fund application is now available. Eligible LEAs will fill out this ESSER fund assurances in order to receive funding. And there is, um, each LEA has an individual password that was contained in that email address. The uh, application is pretty simple. It's just a certification that LEAs um, will agree that they've read and agree to comply with all the requirements, assurances, terms, and conditions. Um, there has been a question. I think we did try to address it um, in our previous SFP Zoom as well, but we uh, talked to someone at CDE that kind of um, uh, assured us that th there, there's been a question, I guess, about whether an LEA needs local board approval for the application or acceptance of these funds. And the recommendation is to go ahead and follow your own um, LEA's process or protocol. Uh, there is no requirement to indicate a board date on this application. So when you get to that, you'll see there's uh, no place on there that requests the board approval date. Um, but the, so the CD says there is no such requirement at this time. But the assurances do include, if you read them, the, um, that it, it includes compliance with transparency requirements and requires that the application and any subsequent reporting be, meet, be made readily available to parents and the general public. So as such, being a public document, it may be reasonable to be sure that this is something that is communicated with your local board in some way. LEAs should apply by July 15th in order to be in time for your for the first wave of payments which they're anticipating would be sometime early september if you do not apply by july 15th you'll still receive all the funding for which you're eligible but the payments just might be delayed and we do not yet have details about the reporting requirements but it's likely that it'll be something where leas will be asked to report the the amount of funds spent in each of the 12 categories of allowable uses that are outlined in the cares act Next slide. We're just going back to this table to cover the two remaining columns. Um, this is uh, where we don't quite have the full details on the gear and CRF funds. So the table is just sharing with you what we do know. Um, the gear and CRF funds are being finalized as part of the state budget process. And we heard that yesterday morning, it was announced that the governor, Senate and assembly have reached an agreement um, so those details haven't yet been announced. I know that different um, uh, emails are probably coming in with some preliminary information, um, but we have heard that the additional information, including uses of funds and allocations, will be released soon after this is all finalized. It is anticipated that the distribution of funds would be based on high need students, such as students with disabilities or our unduplicated pupil groups because that funding is meant to support those that are most significantly impacted by coronavirus. Um, I'm sure everything will become a little bit more clear as additional details are released. Um, go ahead, let's move on to the next slide. This last slide, uh, we want to just make mention, you may have heard of the HEROES Act. Um, we didn't put this in the chart because it's not quite yet a reality. In fact, the, it's still waiting Senate approval, but members of the Senate have indicated that they're not in favor of approving it. So we're not sure what will happen with this. Um, there are a number of issues outside of the education realm that are a matter of ongoing debate and disagreement within this HEROES Act. So we'll need to wait and see where this goes, but um, this is part of that funding, um, assuming that some additional funding might be coming into education. So with that, we're gonna move on. Um, Evan's going to share some more moving forward with CARES Act and equitable services and the considerations for that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, since the subject of equitable services and the CARES Act continues to elicit questions, we have some new slides that we think help explain the conflicting interpretations uh, between the original legislation and the Congress's intent and the guidance that came out from the US Department of Ed. 
Um, in addition, we, uh, as Amy mentioned, we were on the phone actually this morning with the Office of Government Affairs um, Federal Policy Liaison at the CDE and just got some additional clarification that we wanted to share, um, including um, a recent position that the CDE has taken on the, on the matter of, of the guidance. And this first slide, I want to note, and several to follow, they were created by our colleagues at Alameda County Office of Education. They're really, really good looking. I'm really impressed and that they really helped clarify, I think. Um, they've done a wonderful job with the graphics as well as highlighting the key differences. So in this slide, we see the key controversy, which is the different interpretations of the formula for determining how funds are reserved for equitable services. The traditional Title I interpretation, which is in the orange text box on the, on the left, and which members of Congress have indicated was their intent when writing the CARES legislation is that, quote, funds are held for private schools that are based on the number of low-income students in the district boundary who attend private schools. In contrast, the Department of Ed guidance in the, the greenish, I guess maybe teal box on the right, interprets the formula as, quote, funds that are held for private schools are based on the total number of students who attend private schools in your district boundary regardless of income level. So a big difference there. Next slide, please. Now the CDE specifies in their, their ESSER fund FAQ, and I just want to note too, by the way, uh, GEAR funds, we didn't mention it, GEAR funds are also subject to uh, equitable services, and we will get in more detail in the future. We did kind of clarify that even though the GEAR funds may be appropriated at a different, using a different formula, uh, the equitable services would be, still be subject to the low income formula, but more to come on that. Anyway, the, the ESSER fund specifies that the state adheres to the interpretation that the LEA reserves the ESSER or receives ESSER funds must reserve for any activities um, supported by ESSER funds related equitable services to students and teachers in non-public private schools in the same manner as provided under section 1117 Title I Part A of ESEA. So they, they, they lean into the Title I interpretation. Next slide, please. Um, further within that uh, ESSER, the CDE's FAQ, in referencing the Ed Department's guidance, uh, they note the following, that this guidance will, quote, likely result in most cases in a much higher amount being allocated to private schools for equitable services. The ESSER FAQ also notes that um, the ED's interpretation is controversial and indicates that a number of states, advocacy organizations, and interested parties consider the interpretation to be incorrect. The FAQ includes the suggestion uh, made by Secretary DeVos that LEAs who decide not to follow the Department of Ed's guidance should put the difference between the amounts generated under the proportional student enrollment formula and the Title I Part A formula into an escrow account until the issue is resolved. Um, however, you'll note in the final paragraph here, which is highlighted, um, the CDE states their opinion that Congress intended the funds to be allocated consistent with the Title I formula. Uh, we'll discuss the implications of this opinion in a moment. Um, first, though, we'd like to share an example of the funding difference between these two interpretations using um, a hypothetical LEA. Next slide. So in, this, in the first slide, you can see um, this is the Title I calculation for this hypothetical LEA. Um, uh, you can see that by dividing the LEA's $900,000 ESSER allocation by a denominator that is the sum of the low-income students enrolled in the LEA and the low-income students in the private schools. The result is a proportional share of $600 per pupil. After multiplying the per pupil share by the total enrollment of low-income private school students, the total share to reserve for equitable services, in this case for private schools, would be $90,000. Next slide. Now, by contrast, we see the differing result when following the Department of Ed guidance, and parenthetically, they call it the Title II calculation here. Um, in this calculation, the denominator is the sum of the total LEA enrollment and the total enrollment of private schools who seek to participate. Um, while this reduces the per pupil amount to just $360 because the total enrollment for all students in the LEA's private schools is 500, the proportional amount that this LEA would need to set aside for equitable services is $180,000, so a $90,000 difference. Um, and I just wanna stop here to make a critical point um, for any state and federal program directors. Uh, this really is something that, you know, you're gonna wanna do this homework um, to figure out what the difference in the calculations is. And then you really wanna work with your CBO and your superintendent to ensure that they fully understand not just what the difference uh, in dollars is, but also what will be required of the district in providing equitable services 
at the different levels. Um, and you definitely do not want to be a lone wolf in this decision making. You want to get a lot of support and understanding um, because this a lot of times it does fall on you to provide equitable services. And, and you can see in this differing amount, there'd be a lot to, to follow up on and follow through with on these, these schools. So keep that in mind. Next slide. Um, so most importantly, um, you need to share um, with your with your um, superintendent and others in cabinet that there is a process that's outlined here in the ESSER fund FAQ for a private school to file a complaint if they feel that the LEA is violating the equitable services requirements. So if you say we are going with the Title I formula um, in determining the equitable services and they disagree, the first step in the process is to file for them to file a complaint with the CDE, which we know from an earlier slide that the CDE is going to back you up because they believe that the title formula was the intent of Congress. However, if the private private school is dissatisfied, they may then appeal to the Secretary of Education, and we know that she has a different interpretation. So CDE ultimately suggests here in their FAQ that the district seek their own legal guidance before making any final determinations. Next slide, please. So there's spectrum of scenarios. Um, definitely, as I said before, do your homework. Um, know what the, guide, the difference will be. Get your backing of your superintendent and cabinet. Bring everyone in on it. Um, but one recommendation that we had that, that really kind of actually still adheres to the guidance um, would be to make a good faith gesture to your private schools who want to participate um, to move forward in consultation using the Title I calculation allowing that if a more definitive interpretation is made, you will adjust the equitable services amount accordingly. Um, and th there is a re there's some reason for, for them wanting to participate with you um, in the sense that uh, equitable services is, are, are services, they're not cash. You can't pay cash directly to a district. So if they choose not to um, participate in the services, they're gonna just be delaying receiving any services. So while LEAs are able to use the funds to pay co pay for costs going back to March, um, private schools aren't entitled to just the cash payment or reimbursement for those prior expenses. So really it's in their best interest to start working with you now. So make a good faith effort is what we're recommending um, using the Title I. Um, a long delay in consultation stemming from a disagreement isn't uh, in their interest. Um, assuming, assuming that they need the relief immediately, um, and they, they accept your good faith offer, they get the services to start as soon as you get funding. Now, if they decline the services based on your provisional amount, they disagree with you and want to contest that, just be sure to document that they've turned down um, your, your effort to consult. Um, next slide. And just finally, a few related links to what we've uh, noted here. Um, we'll be sure to include this in our follow-up uh, FAQ as well, which you'll receive by email or you can access from our website in the next two days. And now for a few uh, last updates, um, so we're gonna hand it over to Rachel. Hello everyone. I just have a few updates regarding the LCAP federal addendum. Next slide, please. So the CDE has indicated that they will be taking the 2019-20 LCAP federal addendums to the July state board meeting for final approval. They have also indicated that some LEAs still do not have an approvable addendum, meaning a yes in all programs. And so these are the federal addendums that LEAs initially submitted last summer. The CDE has provided county offices with a list of LEAs that do not have an approvable addendum, and we are reaching out to those LEAs to provide assistance. The CDE has also streamlined their internal review process to assist LEAs in getting an approvable addendum. So if the LEA can get a yes in all programs by the close of business this Thursday, July 25th, then the addendum will be included for approval at the July State Board meeting. If an LEA cannot get a yes in all programs by July 31st, then there could be a delay in funding. Next slide, please. So these are just a few reminders regarding the addendum. So the LCAP federal addendum is only required to be submitted to the CDE for approval once during the current authorization of ESEA, which means that LEAs are not required to annually submit an updated addendum to the CDE. 
Only LEAs seeking federal funding for the first time are required to submit a board approved 2020-21 federal addendum to the CDE. So for example, if an LEA previously did not apply for Title IV funds, but would like to apply for Title IV funds for the 2020-21 school year, then the LEA would need to complete and submit the Title IV portion of the addendum to CDE for approval. And the CDE has not yet provided a timeline for this submission process. Although LEAs are not required to annually submit an updated addendum to the CDE, LEAs are encouraged to locally review and update their addendum as part of their yearly strategic planning process. And next slide, I will now turn it over to Jeannie for a Williams update. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. This is Jeannie. I'm going to give you a quick Williams update. So for the Williams requirements, um, these continue to be effect, and the CDE has provided some uh, FAQs to some questions that LEAs are having about how to meet these requirements and how county offices can provide monitoring and oversight while this period of time of adjusting instructional delivery systems and adhering to um, health department requirements is in place. So for the facility requirement, you might be wondering how visits will occur and if new requirements addressing health conditions apply. In the F FAQs, um, they address con the continuing requirement for districts to maintain their facilities in safe and good repair and to continue to have systems in place for monitoring the condition of their facilities. CDE indicates that the inspections should comply with CDE health guidelines and um, the CDE guidebook for safe reopening of schools and that the inspections at Williams sites uh, must be completed uh, still by the county office uh, during the upcoming uh, school year. I'll go on to the next slide and talk about some of the questions that address the uh, instructional materials. Next slide, please. Thanks. So for instructional materials, uh, CDEs, FAQs address some of the questions LEAs are having as they're shifting their instructional delivery systems, which are requiring the use of particular materials. Annually, as you know, LEAs are required to hold a public hearing within the eighth week of school to document sufficiency of instructional materials for each pupil. And this ensures that all pupils have access to the um, required standards aligned instructional materials for use at school and at home. CDE has indicated that if the instructional materials currently in place or previously adopted last year in their resolution, don't work well for remote learning, the school district can supplement with instructional materials that have not been adopted by the state, state board as long as the instructional materials are aligned with the content standards. CDE also indicated in response to a question about, does the district have to provide all students with hard copies of adopted texts? And they indicated that uh, the, the materials should be aligned to the content standards and be consistent with the content um, and cycles of the curriculum frameworks. And the instructional materials could be a variety of things. They could be printed or non-printed. They could include textbooks, technology-based materials, um, or other um, educational materials and uh, tests. And so really um, what's important Critical is that annually the school board should be maintaining their documentation on the materials they have adopted to align with the content standards and to main evidence that all students have access to these um, materials. For the year uh, moving forward, LACO's process for 2021 will be um, provided to address sufficiency of instructional materials um, in uh, a remote setting using a combination of surveys and or documentation through district's um, system of documentation. And in this way, they will um, review the access to standards aligned 
instructional materials that districts are um, providing in the, the 2021 school year. And included on the slide is contact information for our LACO instructional uh, materials unit. And should you have questions, please contact uh, here at Chown in the instructional materials uh, unit. Thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bonnie to finish up with the updates. Whoops, try getting off mute. All right, <laughs> just a couple um, announcements and some upcoming deadlines. Um, some deadlines, first of all, a reminder, the written report to the community uh, is needs to be adopted by the local board by July 1st, 2020 and submitted to the county office. Um, and if you have any questions about that, contact us. Also, just a reminder, those of you that have comprehensive support and improvement schools, you will have an expenditure report coming due the end of July. So you might put pieces, um, processes in place to get that going. Next, um, another uh, deadline that has been extended actually, and that's for the community eligibility program. This is a program that Generally, it goes through your food services department, but it allows high poverty schools to feed all their students without having to collect um, annual uh, um, application forms and also allows um, it, it helps expedite the feeding of students so you don't have to deal with who's free or reduced you just can feed the children. But there are some issues related to um, uh, how you collect data then for LCFF funding and also for, um, for your ranking. That can all be dealt with, but you just need to be part of that conversation. But it's a great option for high poverty schools. It can be by school or by groups of schools. Uh, the other thing, I'm not sure if we got another slide in here or not. Um, looks like it didn't make it, but. It, we did, <laughs> okay. We had news on the state budget uh, um, uh, today. The budget trailer bill actually has been, um, been in continuing to evolve. And um, last night there were some agree more agreements made and this morning a new trailer bill was released and it's Assembly Bill 77. You, you might have seen that bill, it's been kind of morphing. Um, the key significant change in terms of our world here would be that the requirement for a learning a continuity and attendance plan would be put in place with specific requirements and it would be due September, whoops, that should be 30th uh, of this year. And would, that would then eliminate the December submission of the 2021 LCAP. There are a lot of questions here. It's not finalized until it's signed by the budget, uh, by the governor. The governor has to sign the budget bill by June 30th. He doesn't have the same deadline for this bill, but because it's so integrally related to the budget bill, um, there's a sense that the governor will sign them both by the 30th. So any um, issues or questions related to that need to be resolved. Um, before it's signed. So in, in light of that, we will probably be talking to you again soon because there are some provisions in there that address federal funding also. So we will continue to follow it, but as I said, just came out today. So some big changes there. All right, next slide, anything? And these are just some resources on, on school opening uh, that might be helpful to you from our office and from CBE. I uh, just did want to, one thing just on the federal addendum, um, I may have uh, not gotten it clear there that the deadline for anyone who hasn't submitted uh, and gotten that approved, I'm sorry, for those of you that are on that list that haven't gotten that approved, this, it is this Thursday, the 25th, that uh, that, that is. So that's a really short timeline. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. All right, next slide. And... Um, you can see this is the end of, of our Zoom meetings for now, but we will be um, we will be updating you if if any there's any news that um, we need to share with you. We will be here via email, and we do have uh, and on the next slide you'll see a list of some upcoming um, 
professional development we're offering. We are doing this in lieu of our new directors uh, workshop that we usually do, which is a two-day workshop. Instead, this year we'll be doing Tuesdays and Thursdays in August on specific modules. So if you're new or if you're experienced and want to pop in on one or two of them, you're welcome to join us. And information regarding those uh, modules will be going out soon, as will information on the consolidated application workshop um, that'll be in July. Okay. And we will be getting back to you. We want to get you off. You now have four minutes between now and the CDE webinar if you um, will, are participating in that. But we will get the FAQs out to you. We will post them and we are here for all your questions. Um, here's our contact information and uh, we will be talking to you soon. We'll leave this open for another five minutes for uh, any additional questions you might have. And, uh, and um, also, I think we have a few people retiring. I know Lourdes Hale out there is gonna be leaving us. Goodbye, Lourdes, we're gonna miss you. Anyone else that we're gonna be losing this year is going into? All right, well, if you are, we're certainly gonna miss you. And thank you for all you've done for, for your students. Keep in touch with us. We'll be here. We're not going anywhere. Take care.